so I'm presenting uh, Screen Dance, a journey for artistic agency and a workshop proposal for a non-binary technological space. So I'm going to talk in and show images for 25 minutes or so, uh, but my talk ends in a 20-minute workshop. So while I'm talking, uh, I ask you, you can remove your shoes and make sure that you have your mobile phones ready because you're going to use them in the workshop. Okay, let's start. Sorry. Is there something? Do you all hear, hear, hear yeah. me? Also on Zoom, yeah. So, uh, I was present at uh, the first ever Dance for uh, Cameras Symposium here at University of Wisconsin-Madison 22 years ago. I share informal photos of these lovely people. Let us just acknowledge who we see in the picture, especially those who are not with us anymore, but who are still our very important ancestors, Noria Font and Eileen Sommers. For those of you who were here 22 years ago, maybe you remember I brought my baby Toste with me and I was also expecting Egil. I remember that I was at the time quite shocked to hear how unusual I was. I was given the identity as the artist who made films and gave birth. The present female artist revealed it was not possible to be both a mother and an active artist. You had to choose. So the reason I bring it up now is more political than personal. However, these reactions evidence a gender gap in artistic agency, which was disturbing. Screen dance has been shaped by female pioneers, filmmakers and choreographers. This is and has been hard, unrecognized work, mainly done outside institutions. So therefore, I thank again Douglas Rosenberg, Li Chaoping, and Ellen Bromberg, who were so helpful uh, 22 years ago, taking care of my baby Tosta, so that I could take part and continue to be an artist. So, and if uh, anyone wondered how baby Tosta and his little brother Egil are doing now, I brought some photos. <laughs> uh, so they were both dancers for a while. Now they are two lovely, young, and open-minded persons. They were early exposed to video art, screen dance, and electroacoustic music. I think they both belong to the extended screen dance family. In his keynote talk from the symposium 22 years ago, creating a context, the inclusive canon, Rosenberg pointed out that although dance for camera is currently experiencing a renaissance, it lacks a forum for critical evaluation of the landscape of dance for the camera. Do you remember where you were 22 years ago? And can you tell where you are now? Twenty-two years ago, I was occupied with surviving as an artist. And that meant fighting for the continuation of creating art, which in my life began as an impossible privilege. Making 16 millimeter movie, movies, even the shortest one, was then a utopian privilege, but for me personally represented the urgency to escape conservative spaces for dance and for film in my hometown Gothenburg, second largest city in Sweden, with an emphasis on second, which I also spoke about here 22 years ago. The urgency was to survive and to make visible the invisible that there existed a poor but thriving art form called dance, independent dance, punk dance, postmodern dance, outside the institutions and outside the capital. Prepare to be constantly ridiculed, but tell the world that here existed people, such as dancers and choreographers, that ballerinas were people. Technology brought forward different temporalities through time lapse, slow motion and speed, and we were in the beginning a bit obsessed with how dance for the camera has the possibility of bending time and space limitations. The problem either is to reduce the camera to a tool to overcome dance's ephemeral character or to believe that live performance can be fully reproduced on screen where Noel Carroll, 
who also spoke here 22 years ago, questioned the field's use of the terms camera and screen. He pointed out that both refer directly to specific technologies rather than to dance in a moving picture context. Instead, motion picture dance allows for the inclusion of other current and future technologies able to reproduce moving images of dance. By the end of the conference, there was a common understanding that the field is not dance plus camera or camera plus dance, but the results of both. Finding a screen dance symposium with pioneers like you helped me to slowly formulate how to proceed further. It had been impossible to follow the highways of Swedish film industry. After I had made many videos as well as my second film, The Dancer, A Fairy Tale on 35mm, a feature film combining dialogue and dance, I was invited to join the, the network Doris for female film directors in Western Sweden. But while the other members made real film, I made a deviating dance film. And Katinka Farago, Ingmar Bergman's film producer, wrote to me, you are so funny. Why don't you forget about dancing and focus on dialogue? <laughs> so therefore, the Screen Dance Symposium 22 years ago was so important to enable a reformulation of what dance on camera is. Dance film screen dance is its own art form with its own history, like the, you, you already said her at the wonderful table. It's on methods, it's on festivals. It emerged in the spaces between the dance and film institutions. I can today reply with a firm voice that the point is not about the need to translate dance for the camera, document ready-mates competing with fiction film, or capturing choreography for marketing purposes, but instead to create something that did not exist before it was captured by the camera. I come directly from a digital conference called Decolonizing Tertiary Dance Education, Time to Act, organized by Stockholm University of the Arts in Sweden and Makerere University in Uganda. <coughs> I am therefore bringing with me the word decolonize, which should not become a static word, but an active verb that urges us to work for change. Which practices do we need to scrutinize for change? The way Rosenberg taught screen dance at ADF in 1997, and the way Diane Reed in Australia uh, taught screen dance, offered a change on how to use the camera working with dancing bodies, as well as capturing dancing bodies. The method offered a more careful way of approaching the dancing body, slowly acknowledging how a body could be composed inside a frame, and how that changed choreographic structures, but also the very presence of dancing bodies and how they are communicating. Leaning towards critical ethnography and processing how we observe and portray each other, I think screen dance methodologies derived from postmodern choreographers were able to decolonize certain norms in choreography and certain norms in filmmaking. Looking back at my adherence, a study in choreography for camera, I would like to propose that Darren was someone who managed to decolonize certain structures and power geometries through her screen dance. And this is not only related to the fact that filming dance indeed enabled dance to take space in other spaces outside theaters and studios. The fact that Darren fled the white volunteer army troops and the Kiev pogrom in Ukraine made her sensitive to inequalities and oppression. First, I think it's important to acknowledge her contribution to work outside the bigger institutions. She had a small budget, but she created films of huge artistic and historic value, which pro provided an alternative to the mainstream. Second, working with Tali Beatty as soloist in a time she was also decolonizing the North American film industry's obsession with white artists. Thus, Darren was not only making what we today acknowledge as the first screen dance work. 
Her collaboration with Tali Beatty could be seen as a decolonizing act. Beatty's claiming of space in elegant apartments scares squares with colonizing architectures with and through his own body, trained in modern dance techniques derived from non-European dance, indeed supported a change of practice. Third, the way Darren allowed Beatty's presence through locations changing from scene to scene, questioned the fixed narratives and the logic of time in conventional film. There is here a connection between Talibiti and Sweden. In the late 1960s, many African-American artists escaped racism and traveled as performers and pedagogues to Europe. Talibiti, Claude Marchand, whom I trained with, uh, Walter Nix and Donald McHale brought something brand new to Sweden, uh, the legacy of Catherine Danham, yes, yes, labeled as jazz, which mostly women trained, Jazz ballet or jazz dance became extremely popular in Sweden. Talibiti and Donald McHale described how they were seen as modern choreographers, creators of modern dance in the US. However, in Europe, they became known as jazz dancers, exotic entertainers, and trainee teachers. They were loved and appreciated teachers and artists in Sweden, and Talibiti also worked with the Kulberg Ballet, a legacy that is constantly being reinforced through the help of dance scholars like Astrid von Rosa and Lena Hammergren. Uh, so here you see uh, the, on the same year I was born that Tali Beatty is teaching jazz or modern dance in Stockholm, Sweden. I now show some photos from performances where screen dance for me also works as a co-dancer, a co-artist. Uh, a production design, and something to, to reenact and, and dance with or engage with. Okay. 22 years ago, I not only went to Madison, I also went to Kyoto, Japan, to begin my studies of Nihon Buyo with Nishikawa Senrei. The workshop we will do together today is the result of a combination of my studies in Japanese dance since 2000, screen dance, and my PhD studies at the University of Roehampton. In June 2021, I submitted my doctoral thesis together with 11 hours of video material, understanding that I had entered a new theme in screen dance. Screen dance as a durational practice for experiencing and being together in space through technology. The thesis bears the title Suryashi as Experimental Pilgrimage in Urban and Other Spaces, and it consists of an analysis and documentation of slow Suryashi walking through urban and other spaces. The question on what Suryashi might activate or act upon in urban and other spaces in terms of screen dance follow the footsteps of dance filmmakers like Maya Darren and Yvonne Rayner. Darren and Rayner were searching for new choreograph choreographic dramaturgies, and part of their methods was to relocate dance from theatrical spaces to other spaces. And early cinema and photography were occupied with the phenomen phenomenology of bodies in motion to prove images that moved. Their choreographies were made direct directly for the camera without any prior life on stage. Just like the Suryashi pilgrimages performed for my doctoral thesis, the use of slowness was put in conversation with earlier cinema's fascination of movement, where bodies in motion were used as a way to prove the medium itself. Instead, slow Suryashi was revealing the societal speed through my own body rather than through technology. As such, it counteracted the extreme physicality performed in the 1980s and 1990s dance films choreographed by Edouard Locke, Wim van de Kevers, and Anne Therese de Kersmacher. These films, which I delved into as a young choreographer, normalized violently physical expressiveness and narratives fast-forwarded through intense 
and fast-paced editing. Suryashi captured on camera instead offered slower, pragmatic narratives than what the 1990s screen dance pieces did. Also, it introduced the creative possibility to lessen <coughs> one's own presence in space. Suryashi in urban spaces contributed with a different kind of plasticity, encountering situations filled with surprise and curiosity. And here I refer to audience reactions, comments, and interventions experience as the practice proceeded. The experimental pilgrimages captured on camera showed how also small changes of movement could have an impact on audiences and society. Uh, the Suryashi pilgrimages captured by the camera for my doctoral thesis entered a framework of auto-ethnographic durational art. I was inspired by what filmmaker and gender scholar Trinte Minha calls speak nearby. Minha emphasized the importance of constantly having contact with what was actually within ourselves or of understanding a structure from within ourselves. Talking nearby instead of talking about was a technique for making visible the invisible and refused to objectify the interviewee. I have added walking nearby to Mina's me method. So I will now show <clears throat> an example of the many Suryashi pilgrimages um, from my PhD, and this one performed with someone you know. Uh, <coughs> this one was recorded and performed with Doug <coughs> Douglas Rosenberg during the Dance on Camera in New York in 2015. So I'm going to re revisit my own journal experience from, from this practice. The people around us, our involuntary co-dancers, passed in different rhythms which amplified our slowness. When watching the video, I saw how we were walking on the diagonal, a powerful line often used in solos and pas de deux on the Western dance stage. Suryashi usually activated the Hashigakari, the bridge race for spirits in the North Theater, but practicing with Douglas, I focused more on following the rhythm of his steps and worried if he was in pain. Also, the way we were placed in the frame showed a rather traditional placement on stage and in dance film. I noticed a ballet dancer stretching her legs behind us. After a couple of walking steps, she grabbed a handrail and started to do battement jeté, exercises from the classical ballet. Her rhythm was different from ours. Ours were consistent, hers was changing. The space had its own lightning, its own sound space, sounds of our slow feet, of faster footsteps, I'm going to close this, uh, birds singing, cars accelerating, buses breaking, augmented through Suryashi. So, so today's screen dance and dance for camera are situated with contemporary choreographic practices. They are not separate practices since the camera has become an everyday tool used extensively for documentation and self-expression. The com camera supported my collection of Suryashi performed as experimental pilgrimages in urban and other spaces. I have mostly photographed myself, which activated gender discussions on who owns the gaze and who has agency, particularly in urban spaces. It links my work to the lineage of women's self-portraiture, which I particularly addressed for my Suryashi pilgrimages to Paris, uh, the city for the male flaneur, but I don't have time to talk about that now. Uh, I just wanted to also to, to present uh, loved screen dance makers that I have encountered. So we have Sibina Sper Sperling, who I think is with us, who is director of the Video Danza in Buenos Aires and who invited me to Buenos Aires in 2005. I'm presenting uh, Dr. Diane Reed. Um, whom I met in Melbourne and whom I also invited to Sweden to uh, teach a screen dance workshop and, and create uh, work together with me. And I'm showing this image also that 
I, I discussed also with Douglas when we walked together in Broadway that when you're in the screen dance field and you want to erase this kind of binary between making the film and showing the film, and because we was both Diane and me are active artists and, and filmmakers, it became also instead of going to coffee, we would you know stand in the street and perform and put the camera up. So yet uh, something that needs to be acknowledged, I think. Uh, so yes, and I'm also presenting my colleague uh, Benedicte Esperi. Uh, I think that our uh, practices in urban spaces are, are, are definitely develop, developed because we also have a screen dance practice. So we have this durational improvisations. We even talk when we dance together and we document them for the camera. Okay, so uh, Benedicte Esperi, she has also created uh, the first screen dance festival in Gothenburg, the second city in Sweden. <laughs> and uh, the first year she was only showing silent movies outdoors, so that is also yet something that has happened to screen dance. But this year she was paying for artists to also show uh, screen dance. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so now... Uh, uh, yes. I have yet a film to show. Um, so in October 2021, I invited Douglas Rosenberg to Academy of Music and Drama and Stockholm University of the Arts, Sweden, where I work. So I finally have become institutional. Uh, and I screened his brand new film, Song of Songs. And I also made a new screen dance short film, Ancestor, featuring Douglas Rosenberg. So I hope maybe I could show, share that during the symposium lunches. So our screen dance workshop uh, now happened inside the institutional buildings, but outside the institutional highways, outside the capitalist structures of film fiction fil festivals, film festivals we love but continue to produce excluding structures. Um, so the words I find in the screen dance field are generosity, of course, kindness, sharing of memories and knowledge, but also fatigue, lived experience of pushing boundaries, and more fatigue. Um, so, and we are here to talk also about that. So what you see now, it's from the Screen Dance Workshop at Academy of Music and Drama at University of Gothenburg, and it didn't become part of a course, um, uh, but it independent choreographers and dancers came to take this course with us. Um, so we began this workshop uh, with a sonic meditation on technology, which I have recorded and that you will soon try, as an experimental way to also work with my position as workshop leader, teacher or director. So I wanted to observe the process being together with the participants kind of erase my position as leader. And this is something, of course, I'm dominating the space with my voice, but you know, it's like I can also be part of the practice in the circle. Um, so after the meditation, we continue to move slowly uh, through space on bent legs, feet brushing the floor. That is my Suryashi practice. And the instructions were to first use the selfie mode, filming yourself while moving constantly moving and never stopping. And, and, and after that, you then had several choices. One, you could stop the recording and instead start to watch what you had just recorded. Two, you could shift from the selfie mode to camera mode, capturing through the mobile phone more of what and who is around you, acknowledging space. Three, you could interact with others through filming them close up. And four, you could interact with others showing your film simultaneously while moving. So this workshop, I think, erased the binaries between production and post-production, between filmmaker and dance maker, between the camera person and the performing person. And the screening moment was as present as the filming moment. Uh, so it was done in a different way than, for example, the courses I had studied with the Swedish fiction film directors. Workshops so occupied with the ending project that, that what was being created in the moment 
became of lesser importance. Moments of surprise, such as maybe you recently just saw that I slowly approach Sebastian and I'm next to him and I show him my film sequence of the participant Gilda and he shows me his sequence of Gilda at the same time. <coughs> so that created a kind of chance situation, a very surprised uh, situation. And our encounter with that was then captured by Benedicta that you see here on the film too, who was observing us from afar. Uh, so I think that our uh, encounter, uh, you know, really valued uh, the improvisation. Um, uh, and the, it was the chance that decided that the soloist, again, following the postmodern ideas, uh, the important moments, the highlights. Uh, so, um, I propose here that the era of the artifact is over, and that we instead move into the making of art, which Anne was also uh, proposing. So now, uh, come down on the floor, uh, with socks on, please so that you can slide and we will do first a meditation. You need your mobile phone. Yes. Let us form a circle. Put whatever technical device you brought today, a camera, a mobile phone, on the floor in front of you. Welcome to this experimental workshop to which we bring our experiences as artists, educators, choreographers, dancers, filmmakers, humans, in an attempt to process our own presence in space. Please stand in a comfortable position. Allow your shoulders to drop and breathe. Lift your right shoulder. Lift your left shoulder. Here we are together with our shoulders lifted. Let both shoulders drop, 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 drop many times. If you feel comfortable closing your eyes, please do so now. Here we are together with closed eyes. If you are not comfortable with your eyes closed, let them be open. I suggest that you keep your feet just under your hips. Are your knees soft? Do you want to have soft knees? Here we are together with our knees. The departure to what we are doing now and what we will do is related to my practice of the Japanese walk Suriyashi with Nishikawa Senpei since the year 2000. It is also related to my practice of screen dance with Douglas Rosenberg since 1997. We will reflect on two things together as we continue. The first is the very act of making an image of dancing bodies. Who is making the image? Who is dancing? And what might exist between those positions? How can technology support a more caring gaze? Gender scholar and filmmaker Trin Te Minha reflected on her position behind the camera when she was filming in Senegal. She asked how to avoid speak about or on behalf of, as well as claiming to give voice to the other. 
Shin Taeminha created a much quoted speaking nearby instead of speaking about something. Speaking nearby in order to make visible the invisible and to refuse to objectify what is in front of the camera. Speaking nearby means to be very sensitive and aware of one's authority. Speaking nearby could be a way of listening to intervals, a way of manifesting the, the between, keeping the interval alive, working with a sense of touch without grabbing, catching or enclosing. Speaking nearby sets itself apart from speaking about. Speaking nearby refers to an indirect form of speaking that, that, does, that does not objectify topics and subjects. Speaking nearby things that you love, people that you love, movements that you love. And now I ask if you could imagine a movement or a gesture that might represent speaking near my, nearby. Here we are together reflecting on speaking nearby, moving nearby, outside in, inside out. The second thing I would like us to reflect on is our presence in space when we are involved in the act of making an image of dancing bodies. Open your eyes. Close your eyes. What did you see? Direct your eyes to the right. Open your eyes. What do you see? Close, open, close, open your eyes. Close, open, close your eyes. What is our full visibility? And could we lessen our own presence in space? I propose to reflect on opacity. Opacity is the degree to which light is allowed to travel through, where the full appearance of an image is 100%. Full dominance of space and full visibility, which historically has worked against coexisting and collaboration. Please open your eyes. Lift your hands in front of you. Wiggle your fingers. Imagine your hands are invisible. Wiggle your fingers. Bend your knees. Slowly bend down to the floor to pick up your camera or phone. Feel the weight of this technical device. If possible, move it between your hands. Here we are together holding technology in our hands. Turn your back to the circle. When you have turned your back to the circle, you can still feel the support from the circle in the back. Feel the support from the others. Feel the space in back of you, but also enjoy the private space in front of you. We will continue to work with our own appearance and opacity. You might have met the concept opacity when you work with Photoshop, and video editing, when you, when you want to make certain things invisible, 
and other things visible. You do this by pulling or dragging various parameters. You can increase or decrease certain presences, characters, objects and subjects on screen. Thus, in the digital world, characters and objects shift focus by decreasing and increasing their opacity. I think this is a digital ghost invoking method. How can this concept be translated to the human body? To the lived, danced moment in the medium of film or video? How can the digital logic affect how we think of our bodily presence in space? I propose an embodied reflection on opacity. <clears throat> Please put your technical device on the floor in front of you. Take a moment to feel your feet. Feel the soles of your feet where the feet meet the surface. Please move your weight to the left leg so that you can release your right leg. And just caress the floor a bit with your right foot. Dance is a physical practice and filming is a physical practice. We can always invite fantasies about where we place our thoughts where we place our dreams, where we place what we love, where we place who we love. So even if you now focus on your feet, your whole body is involved, and also your mind and your thinking. The technical device lies like a diamond in front of you. Please move your weight to the right leg so that you can release your left leg. And just caress the floor a bit with your left foot as if you are drawing. Dance is a physical practice and filming is a physical practice. Here we are together caressing the floor with the soles of our feet. Is this your dance? Come to a still. You might experience stillness. Opacity. Opacity is the degree to which light is allowed to travel through. Let us start an experiment. I will use percentage to describe the proportions. Imagine that your full appearance is 100%. This is full dominance of space and full visibility. We have to fix that. If you have a problem with constantly dominating a space, this is a very good task. We will now experiment with ways to lower our own opacity in order to become invisible. Before we aim for invisibility, reflect on your vision. What do you see in the private space in front of you? When you look carefully, when you inspect the space, what information do you get? When examining, scanning or surveying the space. If you are comfortable, please close your eyes. What do you see when your eyes are closed? Now, see if you could drop some of your appearance. See if you could imagine dropping from 100% to 90%. How does that feel? Continue to breathe. How about lowering even more from 90% to 80%? 
You lower yourself to 50%. Put your hands in front of you, still with your eyes closed. Wiggle your fingers. Lower your hands. You are 50% of your full capacity. Other things might come forward. Other people might come forward. Lower yourself a bit more. Let us experiment with the gaze. Slightly open your eyes, just a tiny bit. Open your eyes as if you are walking in a snowstorm, peering from inside out. With these peering eyes, you can check if you still have any hands. Do you have any hands? Wiggle your fingers. Lift your right shoulder. Wiggle your fingers. Lift your left shoulder. Wiggle your fingers. Here we are together. Here we are together. Drop your shoulders. End of snowstorm. Relax your eyes. Are you still here? Lower yourself to 40%. Continue to 30%. Drop from 30 to 20%. Drop from 20 to 10%. You are 10%. And now you are invisible. Other things are visible. While reflecting on opacity, the stereotypical claim is for the invisible and oppressed to raise their voices. I ask for a greater effort for some presences to lower their appearance, for some voices to pause and listen in order to make visible other presences and make audible other voices. Opacity could be used as a method either for sharing a space democratically or to enable an invisible dance, an invisible dance with non-humans, ancestors, and invisible cameras. Opacity could be used as a metaphor when making performative work behind and in front of the camera, moving nearby, speaking nearby, the poet and philosopher Edouard Guisson presented opacity as a way to bring an end to the notion of scale through which we measure each other's solidity. He proposed opacity as a resistance to be grasped and forced into dominant argument. He used opacity as a way to discuss power geometries between nations. We can use opacity as a way to discuss power, to discuss power and power geometries between the human body, the non-human body, and the technical device. We have the right to remain 20% or 50% of our, our appearance. We have the right to be obscure. This is a prerequisite for hearing others. As we decrease our opacity and as we open the space behind us, other stories can appear and other voices can be heard. Slightly open your eyes as if you are walking in a snowstorm, peering from inside out. While invisible, 
Please pick up your technical device that shines like a diamond in front of you. Hold it. Please wake it up. Do you find the camera symbol? Do you find the video record button? When you have found the record button, please press it. Recording. What is it that the technical device is experiencing? Is it listening? What information does it get? Examining, scanning, surveying the space. Is it speaking nearby? Is it keeping the interval alive? Is it working with a sense of touch without grabbing, catching, or enclosing? While holding your technical device, please increase your own presence. Increase your own visibility. 100%. You are now visible. Others are visible. Here we are together, visible. Please turn back to the circle, facing the middle of the circle. What does the technical device see? What do you see? Press stop. Stop recording. Lower your hands. Wiggle your fingers. Thank you. Thank you. Nine minutes left, so I'm proposing that um, we just continue recording, screening, if, if anything that you remember from what I said from the workshop. So you could, and you don't have to do correct, so yes, you can just move around. So my proposal is that you, you, you can have the, the selfie, so you record yourself, then you change, and you pick up what is uh, outside and then remember you can you, you can press um, stop and for example if I find you here in movement we can just pass each other and show what we just recorded. So it would need me more time but let's try whatever energy we have for this task. Thank you. So spread out or whatever you can say.